Hey there, and welcome to Large Format Friday. I'm your host, Matt Mirage, and if this is the first time you're stopping by, here's a playlist of all of our LFF episodes. And if you haven't subscribed yet, each and every Friday, there's gonna be something different in the world of large format photography that we'll be talking about. You know, since opening up the large format questions at gmail.com email a few weeks ago, a lot of questions have been flooding in, but one of them, it's been floating to the top among all the others. It kind of goes like this. What do I do with barrel lenses? Where do I start? There's so much stuff out there. So I'm gonna spend some time with you guys and really start to drill down on what are barrel lenses? How do I get them onto my camera? And what do I do with them once they're there? Consider this a primer on getting started with barrel lenses. So the term barrel lens is kind of an all encompassing one. It's just describing any type of lens that is gonna come not mounted in a shutter. In that sense, we have lenses that have come in barrels since the 1830s, and they have a few different classes of use. Uh, the first general use is pictorial use. So any sort of pictorial lens was one for, well, taking a picture. A lot of times these were like early portrait lenses that had brass barrels, kind of like this adorable little Darlow Pets Fall here. Uh, when you have a lens and a brass barrel with this little handle here, chances are it was for pictorial uses, or sometimes they were also used in projectors, like magic lantern projectors. These lenses often have a really soft look. They usually have fast apertures, so they're great for that swirly bokeh, really shallow depth of field, and they just have this cool kind of fall off because they don't have the corrections that modern glass is going to. The second type of use that we have in barrel lenses are aerial lenses. Now, unfortunately, I don't have an aerial lens to show you guys today. I'll throw some photos up while I'm talking about them. But aerial lenses were pictorial, but for way, way up in the air. So these lenses were usually big, bulky, with huge, huge apertures and openings, and that was so they could resolve a very tiny amount of detail from upwards of 50,000 feet in the air. So you can bet, if it can resolve something from that far away, it's gonna be tack sharp when you're doing things like portraiture and otherwise. These lenses are known for being absolutely enormous, having fast apertures, being tack sharp, and sometimes, you gotta be careful about this, a little bit radioactive. And the final type of lens that we have for our barrel lenses are process lenses. Now, process lenses, as opposed to pictorial lenses, were designed with non-photographic purposes. Well, non-portrait taking kind of purposes. So these were lenses that were designed for use in copy cameras, enlargers, projectors, anything that wasn't what a photographer was using. Maybe they were using it in the dark room or a newsroom was using it to make copy negatives or enlargements. Remember, they didn't have the resize tool until about uh, the last 30 years or so. So in order to make something bigger, they would actually photograph it using a copy camera or process camera and using a large barrel lens that had a really big image circle to do that. Now this is one that you've seen on the show before. This is my Schneider 355G Claron, but this is actually a process design lens. It has a very large image circle. It has a pretty modest maximum aperture. Many copy cameras and enlargers didn't need fast apertures because they were usually gonna be stopped down to maximize depth of field. But these lenses are known for modest size, modest aperture, incredible sharpness, and usually high magnification capability because they were moving really close to smaller objects. Okay, so let's say I just got a barrel lens for really cheap down at the used photo store. I was picking around and I found, whoa, this thing looks pretty cool. I wonder if I can put it on my camera. Well, it's not if, it's how you put it on your camera. To get a barrel lens onto your camera, well, we probably need to get it on some sort of lens board. So to get one of these onto a lens board, you have a few distinct options. You can mount it directly to a lens board, and usually the easiest way to do that is with what's known as a flange. So a flange is kind of like that retaining ring we talked about in the lenses and shutters episode, except a flange goes in front of the lens board. Now this is a custom machined one. By the way, this isn't my stuff. Uh, I borrowed a few, uh, a few goodies from my buddy Ed Gately. He's actually here off camera. He brought these awesome custom machine tools because he's all about playing with big, funky lenses that have a really unique look because he is a portrait artist through and through, and that's what he does. He looks for unique looks in lenses. This lens, fits onto a lens board using this flange. This is a custom machined piece. As long as you know the thread pitch, so the diameter of these, these threads, as well as how thick they are, if they're standard or metric, you give those measurements to a machine shop or a buddy that has a CNC router, and you can get the job done, which is pretty neat and super solid. 
Another way that you can get a barrel lens onto a lens board is to use a really cool old device, what's known as a universal iris clamp. Now, this thing looks kind of like an aperture because, well, it functions just like an aperture. One of these little guys unlocks this, and the other part, when I twist it, you can see these little blades open and close. But what these blades are also capable of doing, think about how you hold a lens. When you want to hold a lens, you wouldn't just hold it with two fingers, that would stress out your two fingers. You hold it at multiple points around the barrel of the lens, or you cup your fingers around the lens, and you have an easier time gripping it, right? Well, that's exactly what these little blades on the iris clamp are doing. They're gripping down with all of these different little points, and that will hold the tension of the lens. Now, these are usually really good for lenses that already were ready to be mounted to a flange, kind of like this adorable little Petzval lens. So, what I would do is I would get this Petzval lens into the hole very carefully, and then I would tighten down the iris clamp on top of it so it's going to hold the attention. Now, these weren't made to hold a lot of weight, and if you get a big old honker of a lens like this guy, that's not going to go so well on this. It was more made for your early pictorial lenses like your brass Petzvals and other similar generation lenses and little projector lenses. Another way that we can mount a lens to a lens board is with a custom system, a custom lens board system. So one I'm going to be demonstrating a little bit later is one that I use with my Cinar camera. See them back there? This is the Cinar DB lens board. So it's a lens board that accepts pictorial lenses, which are meant to mount in certain size shutters. So this is a Monster Copal number three size. So any lens that would fit in a Copal three with the same max aperture of 6.8, like this 360 6.8, will fit in this board and then interface with another system that triggers a shutter. So that's another option for more modern lenses. And then another option that we have to get it into our shutter, or at least on our lens board, is my process lens, my G Claron. This one has threads which actually natively go right into a modern Copal shutter, which is pretty great. I just thread it in as long as I have the shutter. Not all process lenses are going to be threaded the same as most shutters, and you'll need to have some custom machining. So not a big monster ring like this, but something like a stepping ring. So to take you from one smaller set of threads to a larger pitch of threads to get into a shutter. Now this process, if you use really cruddy metal, can be permanent on your shutter, so be really careful when you're exploring that option. Okay, there's one more option, and this is the one that uh, most folks pitch to me when they're asking me questions via email, and that's what I call the super DIY option. Ed brought me another fun little toy, and okay, it's not little, it's a monster. Look at this thing. So this is a big old projector lens, and you can see it has a custom wood lens board with these amazingly thick rubber bands kind of giving us tension on either side. Problems with big projector lenses, a lot of these lenses just have a big smooth barrel, so we can't get any grip with anything like a clamp, and there's nothing threaded, so we can't machine something like a flange, so we have to resort to alternatives, we'll call them. And this one actually works pretty well. I don't feel at any point that this is going to go anywhere, and Man, this is a really fast lens. Holy crud. 480 millimeter f3.8. That is lightning fast for ultra large format. So there are DIY options. Uh, would I 3D print one? Not for a lens this big, but for something a little bit smaller? Yeah, that could work pretty well. I've also seen folks use 6 ply and 8 ply mat board. That works pretty well. But you just need something that's going to have a good enough tension to get on there. So let's say we've managed to get this barrel lens onto a board. How do we control it? Is there a way to control the aperture? Is there a way to control the shutter speed? So if you've mounted a pictorial lens or a barrel lens somehow into a modern shutter, it'll work like any modern shutter. You're gonna have an aperture control and a shutter speed control. If you have it onto the board, but the lens doesn't have its own aperture, you're kind of stuck working at wide open apertures unless you get it into some sort of shutter that can control that for you. Some of the older brass lenses and Petzval lenses will even have a place for a drop-in aperture. It's known as a waterhouse stop. This little Darlow is capable of taking waterhouse stops. If you get a lens that comes without them, there's also folks that are printing them out of aluminum, and you can even make one out of black construction paper, and it'll do pretty good. But 
Who are we kidding? We bought this thing for the wide open look, that dreamy, swirly bokeh. If we have our barrel lenses on a lens board, there are some other ways to trigger it. If you have a Sinar system camera or something that takes Sinar boards, um, like the Canham cameras, uh, the larger 5x7, 8x10, Chamonix, Shenhao, there's a lot of them, Intrepid 8x10 even takes them. You can actually get a specific shutter for this type of mounted lens. So this lens is in what's known as a Sinar DB lens board, and that works with this specialty. The Sinar Auto Aperture Shutter allows you to control not only shutter speeds from a 60th of a second all the way to eight seconds, it also has on the side here an aperture control knob. And what that aperture control does is it presets a position for this lever that pulls another lever on the inside of this barrel and that stops down the lens. We also have an aperture control on the side where I can open and close it. The cool thing about a shutter like this is it's modern. It even has flash contacts. So I can use this little three post cable that plugs into it and use a PC sync. So now I have X sync at any of these shutter speeds from bulb 60th of a second all the way to eight seconds, which is pretty awesome. Now, if you don't wanna go 20th century, you wanna go full on 19th century, there are some other classic options for triggering uh, that shutter. If you have a big soft lens cap, like the one that comes on this Darlow, you can also just open up the cap and close it. But unless you have the fastest hands in the West, you're probably not gonna get very many fast shutter speeds. For faster shutter speeds, there are a couple other options. My buddy Ed was also nice enough to bring by this awesomely huge, what's known as Packard shutter. Now the Packard shutter is a special beast because it uses a pneumatic squeeze bulb. What you do is you put your thumb over this and there is a little pneumatic spring that gets pushed up when I puff some air into it and it opens up the shutter. You ever wonder what the B in bulb is for? It's for this. So there's our bulb exposure. And I can actually get this to about, I would say a 15th or an eighth of a second pretty consistently. Some of these shutters also have a place where you can insert a pin that allows you to do an instantaneous or eye exposure, which was usually around the 15th to 30th of a second range. I'm definitely not fast enough for that, but I can do some nice slow exposures or bulb exposures. And then if you didn't like the lens cap option, you still want something a little bit faster, one that I've actually used in the past when a shutter of mine was sticking, I went on YouTube and this was like 2008 YouTube guys, and I saw this video, it was about using this thing called the galley shutter. Galley as in Jim Galley, one of the older members of the large format photography forum. So the way that Packard shutter opens is it has two little leaves that are creating kind of a, a slit and they're going like that, well, I can use some dark slides for that. So if you have some extra dark slides from a film holder, you can create a spacing like this, have your lens right here and flick it. And depending on how good you are at flicking your wrist, you can create a very fast shutter speed with a lens that doesn't have an aperture, doesn't have a shutter. Pretty cool. Another shutter option that we have for larger barrel lenses that is really popular with the really monster wide opening lenses is what's known as a guillotine shutter. And this is very similar or can actually just be a large focal plane type shutter. So focal plane shutters in Graflex speed graphic cameras are just a piece of fabric with a small slit in it and the size of that slit, kind of like the size of the dark slide slit, is going to give me my exposure. Smaller opening is a faster exposure, larger opening is a longer exposure. These focal plane shutters can be, if they're in a speed graphic, they are in the back of the camera, right in front of the film plane, but they can also be mounted on the front of the lens. And this is a popular option for large aerial lenses mounted to larger cameras. Something like a big monorail can handle the weight pretty easily. But now that we're in the world of 3D printing, we're in the 21st century, there are some other really cool guillotine shutters. So I saw on Facebook a couple days ago, photographer Shane Balkowicz had a custom made Arduino triggered printed guillotine shutter. It was made by Steve Marr and it looks pretty cool. So it's electronically controlled and it has kind of the similar thing to the focal plane, but it's a guillotine style. So it drops down and gives us an exposure based on that little slit or that fraction of a second that it is 
opening in front of the lens. A pretty neat solution. I'll throw a link down below in the description. They're 500 bucks, but a pretty bespoke option if I do say so myself. Okay, so we've talked about what the lenses were for, how we get them on a board, sometimes even trigger them with a shutter, but another question that inevitably comes is, well, which one do I get? And that's where I'm gonna have to put this one onto you guys. When you're looking up barrel lenses, you really wanna look based on what you wanna do. Do you like the soft focus type look? Do you want something that has dreamy, swirly bokeh? Do you not care about distortions? Are you gonna shoot color with it? Do you want it to be really nice and corrected? Are you gonna be doing big enlargements? Those are all gonna be slightly different lenses for you. But like I've recommended in the past, Large Format Photography Forum has this massive lens starter guide. Since these lenses do date to the very beginning of photography, we're talking 1830s, we're kind of left piecing together old PDF scans of advertisements and very, very vague manuals. And trying to find out which lenses will even work on your camera comes down to what data we can find on those lenses. So my best recommendation, still try to go by those focal length recommendations I made quite a few episodes back in lens selection. So you'll see some measured in inches, you can convert that to millimeters. And if it abides by those standards, you know, your 150 millimeter lens is more than likely gonna cover four by five, your 210 is more than likely gonna cover five by seven, 350 for eight by 10 and so on. That's a good starting point. But when it comes to specialty lenses, especially ones that are gonna be really long or really, really wide fields of view, that's where you're really gonna to have to do your homework and make sure that you're gonna have decent coverage and that it's even gonna fit on the camera without some sort of modification. I haven't gotten that deep into barrel lenses. Here's the one that I picked up a couple summers ago. Actually, I didn't pick it up. Uh, my mom got it at an estate sale. She bought a shoebox full of uh, estate sale junk and in it, wrapped in a sock, was this lens. This is an Ilex portrait lens. It's a little dusty and dirty, but I had this mounted. The shutter actually works, which is crazy. I had the folks over at SK Grimes mount it to this Cinar board so I can use it on the big boy back here. And when I use it alongside my Cinar auto aperture shutter, I can even do that with flash. A little bit extra, absolutely, but it's got a cool look too. So if you have any other questions, drop those down below in the comments. Or if you have any long form ones, you can hit me up largeformatquestions at gmail.com. And coming up on Sunday, I'm gonna be doing a live Q&A. So any questions sent between now and then, I'll read on air. And that's gonna be Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Hope to see you there. Thanks again for stopping by and we'll catch you next time for more Large Format Friday.